That was perfect. Almost, I'm like at that, like right down to the second. I mean, we should go pro <laughs> tour. All right. Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Adam, and uh, I made it up the stairs like you did, which means we didn't eat enough. But um, let's start the way that we start every service by praying for another church in town. We are praying for Atonement Lutheran. They are the heightsiest of the heights. They're, you know, at the very end of Wicks, way up there. And we don't have any specific prayer requests. They didn't get back to us on anything to pray specifically. But um, I do have a sense of praying for their multi-generational uh, deal because they've got like a preschool there. They also do a lot of stuff with the retirement community that's, that's right next to them. So that's kind of the way that I feel led to pray. So we're going to pray for Atonement Luther now. So would you join me? Oh, Lord. We thank you that, that Pastor Darren and... Atonement Lutheran cares so much for so many. And so, Lord, would you bless them in, in the work that they do in the preschool, but also, Father, would you bless what they do in the retirement community there just right, right next door? I pray, Father, that you would uh, just show them to be the good neighbors that they are. I pray that you would open the storehouses of heaven and resource all the vision that you gave and Father, I pray that you would just bless from, from the youngest kid in the preschool all the way through to, to the folks in the retirement community, Lord, everybody that's touched by atonement, would they be blessed now? And Father, as they, as they uh, begin their week, would you be with them? Would you make your presence known in Jesus' name? Amen. Well, if this is your first time with us, we do have a contact card in, front, in the seat back in front of you. If you wouldn't mind filling that out and letting us know uh, how we might be able to get to know you a little bit better, we'd appreciate it. Uh, we do have a couple of things going on, but one of them just went on, and I am like a, a brisket piece away from a meat coma. That was so good. I just, I'm looking forward to, you know, finishing spotlights and then, you know, melting into my chair for a little bit and just like having the meat sweats. I'm really looking forward to that. So um, that happened. Um, we're not spot spotlighting, you know, that as a coming attraction, but it was an attraction that we just left. Um, we do have one thing coming up this week. On Thursday night, June 18th, we are doing another takeover of a local restaurant here in Billings. And, and this, the, the takeover deal is where we just say, look, if you're, if you're thinking about going out to dinner this week, if you would, uh, just head over to 406 Kitchen and Tap Room. It's on 27th, right across from the, from the uh, hospitals. And we're just looking to bless businesses that were hit by, by COVID-19 shutdowns. The restaurants took a, a huge hit. Um, you know, there's some that, that are just, that are closing down. I, I just read that Lilac is closing down. And like, it's, yeah, it just is, it's a tragedy. It really is. And the, these are livelihoods. And so this is how we try to do, a, have a small part in, in helping them out. So on Thursday night, at any time, just go over, have dinner at 406, and uh, you'll see some familiar faces. We don't do a thing where we say we're all going to, you know, we try to spread it out. I go early because I like to eat early, so then it, it sets me up for a later dinner as well. You know, if you eat too late, then you're only going to get one. So I like to go as early as possible, but, you know, whatever. Uh, pick your poison and uh, head over to 406 on Thursday for a takeover, and we will bless the local business. Um, so we're going to start worship, but the way that we uh, begin worship is by understanding that the economy of God works that we get to give. And, and the way that we do offering now um, with the way things are going is we've got the offering boxes on the back wall. And also you can give online by clicking on the give button on the website. So um, let's worship. Good evening. I'm going to invite you to stand and uh, let's just open with prayer here. Father, we just thank you that you're here with us, that you're faithful. And we just turn our attention to you this evening, and we ask uh, that you would find joy in our worship tonight. And we love you, Jesus.
Everybody, let's see. Yeah, okay. We all know I'm Alan, so I can skip that part. If you didn't, I told you. You did. I got it now. Welcome to week four of the Keys series. So we have started with mercy and moved on to grace. The last week we looked at love, and so each of these things, and the reason I'm presenting them as keys is because there's the dynamic of if we don't understand mercy and if our relationship with Jesus doesn't begin with us receiving mercy, then our relationship isn't going to go very far. If we aren't anchored in God's grace for us, then our relationship that began in in being recipients of God's mercy, if if we don't grab a hold of the grace and understand that God actually likes us, then we aren't going to get much further. And then if we don't understand God's love for us, we were just talking at dinner, and Larry was referencing a podcast of the things that God can't do. And one of them is God can't not love you. It goes against God's nature. There's no way that God, being who God is, that he can't love you. And so these are things that if we're going to know Jesus, if we're going to walk with Jesus, if we're going to have this relationship with Jesus, these keys are crucial for us to be able to enter into that. So today we're going to actually move from the emotion of mercy, the emotion of grace, the activity of love to what do we get to do. So we're going to talk about faith. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the love that you have for us. And I know that we want to just reflect on the the reality that you can't not love us. Let us see you clearly as you are who you are. And I pray that you would pour your spirit out among us to be with you We love you and we pray that all that we do, say, think, would glorify Jesus. Amen. So faith has morphed over time like most words. Uh, Faith has come to mean um, this set of beliefs that make up what it is to be a Christian. So somebody would say, you know, a grandmother would say to her grandchild, you know, just keep the faith, honey. Just keep the faith. And, and what she means by that is hang on to the things that we believe to be true. Which has to do with Jesus' divinity, Jesus' humanity, Jesus' sacrifice, Jesus' resurrection, our ability to have that relationship with God because of what Jesus has done. All of those things would make up this, this, this bucket, if you will, that we would call the faith. So that, that's what, in some ways, it's come to mean. But the biblical use of the term faith is very much more simple. It means simply trust. So to have faith is for us to trust. To be faithful is to be loyal. That's, that's how it works. Now, we can approach faith from one of two directions. We can approach it from Jesus being faithful and Jesus having trust in the Father completely. For example, in John 13, 3, 
we read about Jesus that Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. And then he goes on to strip off his clothes, gird himself with a towel, wash the disciples' feet. And the, the crucial thing here is that Jesus was able to do the stuff that Jesus did because he knew, knew. That's the operative word. He knew who he was. He knew where he came from. And he knew where he was going. Now, was he there yet? Not at all. He knew he came from the Father. He knew he was returning to the Father. And so that, that piece where Jesus completely knew is where Jesus completely trusts the Father. And he's able then to do the things that, that the Father has laid out for him to do, with, which is not just to wash disciples' feet, but also to be crucified after being tortured, to be killed. And we know that he does those things because he completely trusts God. David and Job both said, Lord, if you kill me, I will still trust you. And Jesus exemplifies that. They were simply foreshadowing where Jesus would actually be killed and still trust completely. And so, so we can talk about the faith of Jesus. Like Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2, uh, it's a trustworthy statement. If we die with him, we also live with him. If we endure hardship, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful for he cannot deny who he is. Which is how faith works. Jesus can't not be faithful. Just like God can't not love us. There can be this reciprocal part of our relationship. If we die with him, we'll live with him, right? If we, if we deny him, he'll deny us. But if, we're, if we lose our faith, if we're unfaithful, Jesus remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. And so we can talk about Jesus' faithfulness and Jesus' trust as a way to begin to understand what it looks like in real time and real life. But the other side of faith then is how do we exhibit and live with faith? How do we do things that mean that we're trusting God completely the way that Jesus did? So when we understand the mercy and the grace and the love, then it comes to this place where for us to step out on that is what faith looks like. We trust that God loves us. We trust that God likes us. We trust that God is merciful. And we live these things in the reality of the world where we are, walking each day with that trust that those things are true. The writer of Hebrews, and people disagree on who actually wrote Hebrews, this, which is really one of the fun things about the Bible, because Hebrews doesn't say. And for years, it was just clumped in with Paul's writings. But it never says that Paul wrote it. And so I'm of the camp that it was a sermon delivered by Apollos. That's kind of where I live. Adam, on the other hand, thinks it was Priscilla or Aquila who actually wrote that, um, Traveling Companions of Paul's. So, um, and you know what? We could both be right, but not at the same time. So, <laughs> whoever it was, we have in the book of Hebrews, we have chapter 11, which is the great chapter of faith. And the writer of Hebrews defines faith this way in Hebrews 11, chapter 1. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. So then the author goes through this incredibly long chapter, 39 verses, which isn't necessarily that long, but gives examples of biblical characters as the heroes of faith. These are the people that received promises from God 
and lived their lives based on the promises that God had made to them. Then we read kind of like a subtotal summary in verse, thir verse 13. The writer says, All these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. And then goes on for the next 26 verses telling more stories of more people of faith, more heroes of faith who lived their lives fundamentally different, obeying something that God had promised to them that this is what I'm going to do. And they had a role to play and they had their peace in it and they faithfully lived their lives doing these things based on what God had said. These are the heroes of the faith. Gets to the end of this, this section and summarizes it this way, starting in verse 39 through chapter 12, verse 3, or 4, excuse me. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. So all, all that he's or she is saying there is like today we have, um, uh, you know, sound systems and we have digital delays. So if you are in a, in a concert venue or, you know, a high dollar church building and you're sitting closer to one speaker, there's a digital signal processor behind stage that is actually delaying the one that's that the speaker that's closest to you so that the speaker that's farther away, those sound waves will reach you at the same time that the one that's close to you does. Does that make sense? And that's all the author of Hebrews is saying happens here. They didn't receive everything that was promised. Even though they lived their lives with faith, they died without seeing all of it because God's intention was that on the day of resurrection, we would all together come into that place of perfection, that some wouldn't get there first. Continues, chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially that sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding the shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. Because what's the opposite of faith? Giving up. After all, he goes on, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. And here's the crux of the issue. Coming to Christ as our king, surrendering our lives to Jesus, does not mean that our lives will be wonderful. Jesus said, because I was persecuted, you will be too. Paul and Peter both, I'm about to read the, the Peter passage, say that we will encounter various trials and doing so tests our faith and builds our faith. And we understand that we aren't going to come to Jesus and all of a sudden things are going to be rosy. We are still who we are. We still have transformation to go through. We are still in the context of a world that is in opposition to the kingdom of God. And we live in the in-between times where the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God are concurrently occupying the same space. I have had many conversations over the years with people who came to Christ and then something bad happened. And because they had bad theology, to quote Brad, that parachute won't open. Because they had bad theology, they interpreted the difficulty in life as meaning one of two things. That either God wasn't real or God didn't care. 
and then they abandoned God and abandoned faith and walked away from Jesus. Bad theology destroys faith all the time. All the time. As I said, Job and David both said, Lord, even if you kill me, I will trust you. We see that exemplified in Jesus. Even if you kill me, I will trust you. Hebrews 11 is all about these people all died and still trusted. And we begin to understand the crux of faith is not about what we get or when we get what we want or what we think that we will get. The crux of faith is about something entirely different. Yes, life will be hard. Think about the world we're living in right now. There's a pandemic that it hasn't gone anywhere. We can ignore it, but the virus is still around. We have an economy that's collapsed. I mean, as Adam said, lilac is closed. I mean, lilac fries. I mean, we would go to Carter's and drink Carter's beer and eat lilac fries and life was good. God loved us. <laughs> so we have an economy that is, that is tanked and, and who knows where that's going to go. We have racial injustices and protests and demonstrations demanding that we change the fundamental institutions that we have operated with for 400 years that have kept things Injust. We have locust swarms that have left Africa and are in, you know, hitting, hitting into India and, and Indonesia. We have floods. We have earthquakes. I mean, we just live in a world where, where right now, at least, there's just this hyper sense of, man, life is hard. And faith is, is at the place where in that context do we look at the waves or do we keep our eyes fixed only on Jesus? Do we understand that the throne of God is occupied and that Jesus is the king of the universe and that Jesus is the one who has all authority and do we trust in him or do we worry about what's going on around us? And here's, here's where I'm talking about the crux of faith is all the stuff that's going on around us, we are going to suffer. Things are not always going to go the way that we want them to. Our friends and family will die. We will have difficulty. But that doesn't mean that God isn't merciful and gracious and loving. Because here, let's get to that Peter passage, right? First Peter 1 Peter 1.7 uh, is the start. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. And we go, oh, God is at work more than simply making things enjoyable for us. Our faith is being tested in the way that creates purity and strength and endurance for the life ahead. And we begin to understand that going to the gym is a good thing. I'm still, I still struggle with it. <laughs> Ask my wife. She's so kind and she's so helpful and she's so encouraging. And I still don't want to go to the gym. No, I don't want to go for a run. I don't. I don't like it. It doesn't feel good. It's not how I would want to spend my time. And when I'm busy, the first thing I drop off my schedule is going to the gym 
or doing any type of cardio exercise. And yet I understand that the reason that I would go to the gym, the reason that I would do some cardio is for long-term benefit, for the ability in years to still be able to be active and do things that I like and that I enjoy. We understand that's how it works, and our faith is the same way. God is not going to protect you from hardship because God wants you to be able to have the endurance of character to weather it and to be strengthened by it. So all of you who are a little depressed right now, next week we're talking, talking about hope, okay? So hang in there for another week. Paul writes about it this way in 2 Corinthians 13. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. Right? Faith is trust. Do we trust mercy? Do we trust that God is gracious? Do we trust that God is loving? Do we trust that what God says about how God views us is true? And that's the presence of God. When I was being discipled in Young Life when I was in high school, the guy that discipled me said this. He said, your emotions are fickle, don't trust them. He said, God loves you, whether you feel it or not. Whether you feel like you're close to God or you don't feel like you're close to God, God hasn't moved away from you at all. And you have to not trust your emotions that will tell you, well, I don't feel like this. I don't feel like I'm close to God. And understand that that has nothing to do with reality. That has to do with your emotions. When I was getting my pilot's license, I, I was doing a night hood flight, which, you know, fog was actually. It used to be a hood, but now it's just, you know, glasses that are fogged over so that all you can see are your instrument panel. And so I'm flying home from Powell, Wyoming with my instructor in the right seat. And I'm just, I'm flying all the way from Powell to Billings by instruments only. And the thing is, it's night and I can't see outside because of the foggles. All, all I can see are my instruments. And my body starts doing this vertigo weird thing, right? And which is what my instructor wanted. He wanted me to do this long enough, and, and, and it really started when I was doing a touch and go at the Powell Airport, and, and all of a sudden, I, w you know, I came off the runway, and, the, and it felt to me like the plane was just going right you know, in a downward spiral to the left. And, and so, um, fortunately, I didn't act like that. And so, I'm flying home, and, and my body is telling me that the plane is banking to the right, in a downward spiral. And I'm talking with my instructor about the sensation that I'm having. I said, it, it, it looks to me like on my instruments that I'm flying straight and level. But my body is telling me that we're in a downward right spiral. And he in the calmest voice just would say, yeah, trust your instruments. Trust your instruments. Because if I had acted on what it felt like, I would have put us into a climbing left spiral that would have stalled the plane. Because I felt like we were going this way, I would have corrected and gone this way, when really we were flying straight and level. The trust was, I trusted my instruments because he would say, trust your instruments. I know it feels like that, trust your instruments. Because he was trying to get me to do this long enough that I began to grab a hold of what my high school discipler would say. Your emotions are fickle. Don't trust them. Trust the truth of what God has said. That he is merciful, that he likes you, that he loves you. Trust that that is true. Trust that God can't not love you. Even if it doesn't feel like that. 
Because if you act on how it feels, you, you, you will be somewhere you don't want to be. And that's the crux of faith. When it doesn't feel like that, do we still trust that it's true? And this is that reciprocal part of the relationship with God where we begin to be in a relationship that goes both directions, where God is loving us and we are trusting God, where God is liking us and we are acting on the fact that God loves us and we are receiving mercy that God has for us because, and then we're acting out on living that life of mercy. The, the faith works this way. So I, I really want to have a good portfolio to take with me to the judgment seat. A portfolio of good works, a portfolio of ministry, a portfolio of being somewhat righteous. So that when I stand before the judge, if Jesus doesn't stand up and say, he's one of mine, then I can pull my portfolio out and say, well, look what I did. <laughs> you know, something. And living by faith means you ditch the portfolio. Because I understand, if Jesus doesn't stand up and say, I'm one of his, I don't have a chance in hell. Well, I don't have a chance. The only thing I have is Jesus is going to claim me. And the older I get, the less concerned I am. I spend zero amount of time now with any concern about life after death. Because I trust Jesus, because I've lived with Jesus long enough to have trust that that's not a concern for me. Amen. And, and so we, we have to live without the portfolio. And that's the life of faith. The trust that God is merciful and gracious and loving means that I'm going to stop trying to earn it and stop trying to deserve it because if, it's, if I can deserve it, it's not love. If I can earn it, it's not love. It's a wage. It's a paycheck for work rendered. If you can earn it, it's not love. And so we surrender to it and receive it as the credible gift that it is. And then we live just trusting that what God said was true. I like to use gravity as an illustration. Because I, I have some scientists in my family, um, and it's really fun to, to talk philosophy with scientists because we, we think we understand gravity, but we really don't. I mean, there's some stuff we do know about it, you know, like the speed of, you know, the speed of the attraction of gravity, but what kind of a force it really is. We, we theorize that it has to do with two bodies in relationship to each other but we aren't really positive. Um, but we know this. I can do this till 64 cows come home. <laughs> and it's going to happen every time. Because I understand that even if I don't see gravity, and even if I don't understand how gravity works, I still live with the effects of it in my life. I live with this bubble of gravity that keeps my feet on the ground, that keeps fluid in my glass, that makes pens drop and not just like bounce all the way back up. I understand that gravity is reality. And Jesus is the same way. Paul's passage in 2 Corinthians, if we understand that Jesus is with us, that's passing or not passing the test of genuine faith. When I don't feel like he's close, but I live my life every day in the bubble of Jesus' presence, 
just like gravity. I may not see it, I may not feel it, but I know the effects of it. And I trust to it. I carry myself physically, my body, I carry it, trusting that gravity is going to be there. And our faith is exactly that. We live our life in the bubble of Jesus' presence because he's merciful and gracious and loving and has said so and demonstrated it. And we trust it because we trust him. And so we live every day, every step, every breath, knowing that Jesus is with us because he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, as you go, disciple the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all I commanded you to do. And yes, I am with you until the end, till the end of the age. I will be with you. And that's our faith. Amen? Larry? Yes. Or that in a certain amount of certainty we exercise our faith. But when Abram took or Abraham took Isaac, he was going to where he didn't know. Mm -hmm. Or they took the guy without seeing the promise. They're going to where they didn't know. They weren't certain. I see so many times myself and folks exercise faith in what they do know. Sure. Right. Yeah. So how do you exercise faith beyond what you know? For most of like, yeah. Like I'm trying to remember we spell like R I S K. Yeah. Yeah. Beyond what you know. Right. Yeah. How how does that That has to do with listening to the Holy Spirit and then doing what the Holy Spirit says. Right? And and even outside of the comfort, because we will do what we know, which is what we feel for most people. And so trusting that God loves you even when you don't feel like God loves you, trusting that Jesus is with you even when you don't feel like Jesus is with you is, is a start of stepping outside of what you know. Because your senses, your emotions are telling you one thing and you're walking in the reality of the other. So, great question. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would rejuvenate our faith. In places that we have been stuck even, whether it's, it's a doubt or a sin, whatever it is that so easily trips us up, Lord, or hijacks us or high cinders us, I pray that you would break those things off of us that we could trust you implicitly. Thank you, Lord. That you're with us as we gather in your name that you are here. as we live our lives in obedience to your Spirit's promptings, that you are here. And when things don't go the way that we want them to, when life is hard, we know that you haven't abandoned us. You said that you would be with us to the end, and we trust you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I'm going to
to invite you to find whatever posture you worship best in. Can we do that? <laughs>
Holy Spirit, we do ask for freedom. Set us free from our striving and our trying. To earn, to be worthy of what you have already freely given us because of who you are. Your mercy, grace, and love. Fill us with faith to trust you completely because we know you love us and are with us. Amen. If you would like someone to pray with you, we'd be happy to. Just come on up and, and somebody from the ministry team will be honored to pray with you. Otherwise, make sure to say thank you again to Chad beautifully done absolutely all right